The gentleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. How much time remains? Twenty-two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And and this is uh, this is probably appropriate for coming after Mr. Jones um, speaking about uh, the United States Marine Corps. Um, I come to you before come before you today, Mr. Speaker, to talk about a great Marine, um, a, a Marine who was just uh, in charge of Central Command and and has retired and and uh, resigned after decades of service to this nation. And, and let me start at the point where I, I was able to meet him. Ten, ten years ago today, the war in I Iraq was underway. Nineteen days after the invasion, Marines and soldiers had dismantled Saddam Hussein's regime. The takedown of Baghdad and I Iraq was precise and supremely coordinated, much to the credit of Marine General James Mattis, who led the 1st Marine Division in Baghdad and just recently completed his tour as the commander of Central Command. On March 20, 2003, Mattis led the 1st Marine Division to the borders of Iraq. The Marines' success and effectiveness sustaining light casualties was due to the intellect, the intellect and the skill of one of the most cerebral warfighters of our lifetime, General Mattis. General Mattis is a tough man, exactly what you would expect from a United States Marine. He's practical in combat while laser-focused on securing the objective. Let me give you an example, Mr. Speaker. On the march to Baghdad, General Mattis landed C-130s on the highway to keep vehicles and tanks moving. Mattis's Marines outsmarted and overpowered Saddam's forces. And in the aftermath, Mattis took a totally different tactic. It was harder to win the peace in Iraq to a certain extent than it was to win the war. But that's when Mattis let his, his, uh, his intelligence and his outside of the box thinking show through. In the aftermath, General Mattis and his commanders working to build trust, establish alliances, and support projects that were important to the Iraqi people befriended the, what, what, what some thought were the, the worst people. I, Iraq and the Anbar province where the bloody battles of Fallujah and Ramadi roared. General Mattis was able to make friends with those sheikhs and with those, with those elders and brought, brought upon the awakening where where those, those local tribes realized that al-Qaeda was their enemy, not the Americans, and they, they then turned on al-Qaeda in Iraq, and that, that was able to precipitate the, the uh, surge and the drawdown from I Iraq, where we won, largely as a testament to, to General Mattis's leadership. There were a lot of other great generals, General Odierno, General Petraeus, General McChrystal, General Kelly, General Dunford, uh, who's now in Afghanistan in charge of, of the International Security Assistance Force. A lot of great generals, but, but General Mattis stands out to me, and I would like to, to relay a quick experience. Um, when I got to Iraq in 2003, I was driving north to join the 1st uh, uh, Marine Division, and we got ambushed, Mr. Speaker. Um, my, my Marine that was on the Mark 19 in the, uh, the gun turret got, got shot in the arm, and at that point, as a lieutenant, we were taught to drive out of an ambush as quick as possible um, and, and link up and, and go, go back and prosecute the enemy if we were able to. We weren't able to in this point. It was 2003. Uh, there, there, there was no radio communication at this point in time. We couldn't talk with higher headquarters. So me being the highest ranking officer in this convoy, and I was brand new in Iraq and frankly didn't know much about anything, uh, we continued north to where the 1st Marine Division was headquartered in a little place called uh, Diwania. General Mattis happened to be in the uh, uh, command operations center when I got there and dressed me down for not prosecuting the enemy that had ambushed my convoy. He was angry, uh, not that a Marine was shot or not, not that uh, we had escaped. He was angry because we didn't get after the guy that got after us. And, and that was a, that, that's a, a real trait of uh, General Mattis's. But for a, a lieutenant like me that had been in country for a few hours, uh, it, was a, it was a stark awakening to, hey, you're in, you're in the war and you have to live up to the expectations and, and the uh, uh, presence and the example set by people like Jim Mattis. I got to meet General Mattis again in 2004 when I returned to Iraq in the Battle of, of uh, Fallujah. And we, we would call General Mattis chaos. That was his call sign because not, not, not only was he the cerebral and intellectual architect of, of, uh, regarding a lot of what the Marine Corps did in the Anbar province, but he was also fearless. He would drive alone 
and unafraid by himself in his own light armored vehicle and he would show up anywhere that he he wanted to at, at day or night in any kind of situation whether there was a firefight going on or not and i'll tell you he he earned the respect rightfully so of every single marine and every single soldier that saw him on the front lines in those wars general mattis was now centcom commander through his leadership, CENTCOM has overseen the Afghan war with a level of confidence and strategy that's indicative of General Mattis's touch. Aspiring leaders would be smart to take a lesson from General Mattis. He well served the United States Marine Corps and America for more than 40 years. I would argue, uh, Mr. Speaker, that, that this administration, with this commander-in-chief, likes military leaders who agree with it. I mean, military leaders that give this administration the answers that they like to get about the way that the world is, is today. And they, they're opposed, frankly, to military leaders who give their honest opinions, regardless of who is commander-in-chief. General Mattis is a type of person that our military needs now more than ever before. And as he prepares to leave CENTCOM for reasons that appear to possibly hinge on politics in this administration and General Mattis's take on Iran, I can say that I speak for the Marines who have served under Mattis that a leader of his kind is near impossible to replace. I'd like to read a couple of quotes. Uh, this, this, uh, this book is called Victory in Iraq, How America Won. The opening page, General Mattis is uh, featured speaking to his Marines, the 1st Marine Division, in Iraq or in Kuwait before the in invasion. Here's what he said. When I give you the word, we will cross the line into Iraq. For the mission's sake, our country's sake, and the sake of the men who carried the division's colors in past battles, who fought for life and never lost their nerve, carry out your mission and keep your honor clean. Demonstrate to the world that there is no better friend, no worse enemy than a United States Marine. I would like to give uh, General Mattis the appreciation uh, of the entire United States House of Representatives um, and, and every single uh, Marine, past, present, and, and future, and, and every single American that owes at least partly the safety of this nation uh, to people like him and to him literally and explicitly for what he's done for this nation. Simplify, General Mattis, and we, we hope that uh, retirement treats you as well uh, as your Marine Corps did. I yield back the balance of my time.